On today's show, an update on Kawhi Leonard, a game against the Utah Jazz that featured a lot of our young guys showing a little bit of themselves, and Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Going to be talking more about round three on today's Locked On Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. <laughs> you are locking in with the. I didn't. Even, I already messed up my. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. <laughs> yes, sir. You are locking in with the clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day. Your team every day. I'm your host, Darian Viziri, born and raised in the greatest city in the world, LA. And your host of Locked On Clippers. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod and subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, where there will be extensive NBA playoff coverage coming up for the next three months, give or take. And Locked On Clippers, two months, is free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. And I want you to let me know what did you think of that new intro? I could not stop laughing because I'm like, I'm thinking about what all you were thinking right now. And it's like, what, what the heck was that? This is apparently our new intro. I just saw it in my StreamYard feed. I got an email from Locked On saying this is the new intro. So please let me know, in addition to other things basketball related, what you think of the new intro. Because that took me by surprise. I just got back from the Clipper game just now against the Jazz. We're going to be talking about that game and a little bit of Dallas. But before we do that, we got to start with the most important thing. And that is the status of Kawhi Leonard and our best players. In regards to our best players, the reason why I specified is because, you know, James Harden has had that foot, sore foot, foot inflammation or whatever, but he played in this game. He played and he looked pretty good. He actually had a blow by against Luka Semanich. And I don't even know if I pronounced that right, but he had a blow by or two and created some good shots when he was playing. Obviously, Paul George, James Harden, Russell Westbrook, Norman Powell, these guys, they did not really play that much in this game, which is great. It's exactly kind of what I wanted to see from the clips, which was play these guys a bit, give them some run just to stay in shape, and then, you know, go to the bench second half and let the young guys do their thing because we don't need to be chasing this game. And also, just having them play a little bit is good, as long as they don't get hurt, of course, which they didn't. So... It was solid. It was exactly what I wanted to see from those guys. And Paul George looked really good when he was playing, too. That was the, the best part. Three for five from the field in eight minutes. Had 10 points and just checked out of the game. He was a plus 11. Zubats was also dominating on the inside. Had a couple of jump hooks. 10 points in 10 minutes. And then James Harden had four points and five assists in 10 minutes. So they were showing that they're they're crisp, they're sharp at the right stage. You know, when it comes to Zubats and Paul George, they've been playing some of their best basketball this season the last two weeks, and especially, you know, in that stretch that we won seven out of the last eight games. And then you had Westbrook, he only played nine minutes, four points, two for four, and Norman Powell, 16. The other names that played a good amount, Terrence Mann, by the way, only five minutes as well, so he's getting rested. He had five points on two for two shooting, made his only three, which you love to see. But the guys that got 20-plus minutes were P.J. Tucker, Daniel Tice, Bones Island, Amir Coffey, Brandon Boston, and 17 minutes and 19 minutes for Xavier Moon and Kobe Brown. So very diverse lineup for us tonight. And it was a one-point loss, 110 to 109 to the Jazz. But before I talk about that, Kawhi Leonard. So, by the way, as far as James Harden, he looks good to me. I don't think it'll be an issue come playoff time. Kawhi Leonard. This is becoming a roller coaster. I'm going to start by going through the sequence of events in terms of news that was shared about him. So, he first missed the game against Sacramento, and that was that one loss in the stretch that we had been getting back on track. Remember, we had lost to Indiana and Philly on back-to-back -back days at home on March 24th and 25th. This was kind of rock bottom for us in terms of any stretch of the season after the initial 0-5 stretch when we first got James Harden into the lineup. 
this was bad. We were looking old. We were looking slow. And that goes for everybody, even Kawhi, who was the best of the bad performances. We got smoked by Philly and Indiana at home. But we responded. And that was when Ty Lue called the team soft. They said, we're playing soft. Our identity is soft right now. Well, we responded with three straight wins on the road. At Philly, of course, no Embiid, but we did win. And you still got to beat Tyrese Maxey, Tobias Harris, the other guys they have. And they've kept them afloat, by the way. You know, Embiid, he had them looking like a top three, top four seed when he was healthy. And he was on that quest for a second straight MVP. But when he hasn't played, that Philly team has still kept afloat to be in play in territory. And a lot of that is the career season of Tyrese Maxey, who might win most improved player. So it was a pretty solid win, and it was a gritty win. We had to play defense to do it in a hostile environment. One by one point, and Kawhi closed the game really well after shooting terribly. And then we got maybe an even better win at Orlando, which is a team that is fighting for a top three seed right now in the Eastern Conference, like or top four seed in the Eastern Conference. It's very impressive what they've done this year, and they do it on defense, and we were able to beat them late as well. Then Charlotte was a gimme game, smacked them in the face. So three straight wins. Then Kawhi hasn't played since that Sunday, March 31st game against Charlotte. He did not play against Sacramento, and we thought it was just load management because he, you know, we're so close to the playoffs, right? I go to the game against Denver on Thursday, April 4th. When I was at that game, that was the second game in a row Kawhi had missed and everybody else is playing. So I started to get a little suspicious and everybody was starting to worry because as we all know, Kawhi Leonard and injuries with the Clippers have been a very dangerous conversation because we always wonder if it's serious because at times they have downplayed the severity of his injuries. All of last season when he had that setback early on, before he came back and had the ankle injury, when he had the initial setback, they were listing him as day-to-day for weeks. And then, this was funny, I went back and watched, re-watched the first quarter of Game 3 of 2023, first, last year's playoff series against Phoenix that we had. I just wanted to see the first quarter of Game 3 just to hear the crowd again because I'm a fiend for that kind of stuff. Clipper playoff crowds. I had some of my best memories in life at Clipper playoff games. I just wanted to rehear what it was like from the TV angle. And you know what I saw that was just so disturbing to me as a fan? Was Christina Pink before the game saying that Kawhi Leonard just has a knee sprain and he might return at some point. Like, just a complete slap in the face of the fans. And you know what's funny is last year I got so much pushback on Twitter about complaining about these things and just addressing the fact that it's just kind of messed up to the fans to not be upfront with the severity of an injury to your franchise player that's getting paid $50 Say what you want about keeping other teams in the dark to keep them on their toes and not giving them a competitive advantage. It's just messed up to the fans. Now, I'm not saying that the team knows that Kawhi is going to be ready for Game 1. There definitely is a level of it's up in the air. That's in the air. (laughs) But last year, he tore his meniscus, sprained knee. That's just ridiculous. So there's very much a reason to be concerned. And a lot of Clipper fans that I talked to at the game on Friday night were saying that they're so annoyed and fed up with this lack of transparency thing. So if you feel that way, say something in the comments about it. But let's just say this. I was told, and I, I told you this a couple weeks ago or about a week ago, that I heard from someone that talked to somebody more in the know that it's just extended rest and Kawhi should be okay. After I said that, Tomer Zarli of Clutch Points had an article that said there is no concern from the organization as of now that Kawhi Leonard will be out for the playoffs. They said that there's hope that he can return for the last couple of games of the season around into form or just gets you know get his legs under him. Well, I said to you, if he does not play against Phoenix, the last three games, I will be worried. Well, he didn't play against Phoenix. He didn't play in this game. It's very clear he's not going to play again until the playoffs. And our franchise player that's led us this far, that we've kept healthy, and I've been knocking on wood the entire season, 68 games is going to be his final number. That's more than I thought. That's above the 65-game threshold. And Paul George has played, what, 74 games this season? Like, Jesus. So happy for him. 74 games. We're so close. And now this is happening where 
Brian Seaman, by the way, in this timeline, Brian Seaman, our play-by-play -play man, said that there is no concern because he was repeating what Ty Lue said, that as of now, there's no concern. They, it should be fine. He should be back. And then Ty Lue said the other day that there is no concern as of now. That as of now part caused a lot of people to raise their eyebrows. Even myself. And I said, if he doesn't play against Utah, I'll be worried. I'm a little worried. Then we heard Law Murray of The Athletic, another one of our beat writers, have a Twitter space today that I attended. And he said, as of now, you know, he said Kawhi was at shoot around. He wasn't running five on five full speed. But I wasn't even told that they did that for sure. If the team even ran five on five full speed because they, they're playing a game tonight or they were playing a game tonight during that practice. But I heard that he was doing strength and conditioning and he was in shoot around. And that's the second time we've seen him in shoot around after he's been missing games. So the fact that he's in shoot around, he's getting shots up, that makes me feel good. He was also at, at the game. So that also makes me feel good. But I've heard from some people that the swelling is real. The inflammation is real. It actually isn't load management. So Lawrence Frank came on the broadcast in the middle of the game, I wasn't. I obviously didn't get to listen to the broadcast, but I saw it after. And this is an exact quote from him. He said, with Kawhi, he's dealing with inflammation. It's no secret he's had a couple surgeries to that knee. It's not uncommon over the course of it where you deal with inflammation. With inflammation, it limits your ability to make some natural basketball moves. So he's working his tail off. The staff is working their tail off to try to help with the inflammation. After the game... Ty Lu said when he was asked by Brad Turner if he will play in game one, he said, this is what we want to see. And then he asked again. So he's going to play. He said, hopefully he will be playing. Going to be talking about more coming up. Yeah, I know. That's a lot. We're going to talk about it. I got to tell you a little something about Stitch Fix. You know that instant confidence boost you get from an outfit that makes you look really good? That's what I get with Stitch Fix. Easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with a professional stylist that helps you find new on-trend favorites that will work for you. My stylist always sends just right pieces and the fit is on point. It's like they have style ESP. I don't know how they do it, but they just get me. Stitch Fix makes it all so easy. I don't like to shop and they save me that time and effort. Plus, I get outfits that make me look good and feel really good. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That's stitchfix.com slash locked on. Stitchfix.com slash locked on. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to you S customers. All right, so I just got to continue where I left off. Kawhi Leonard, that those quotes, they don't encourage me that much. They make me think that I should be nervous that if he's going to play game one. And who knows when we're going to know if he will or not. I'm hoping he will. I would plan that he is going to. I would plan that he is going to. We've got a week off after Sunday. A week. Six days at... at the worst. Praying to God, man. We've come this far. We've come this far. I think he's going to play. But that's just the optimistic Clipper fan in me. Now let's talk about this game. You know, Clippers Jazz. We came out and our starters looked really good. Paul George in his bag. Knocking down the three ball. James Harden turning the corner. Getting us good shots. Had a nice pass to Terrence Mann in the right corner. Norman Powell coming in. Only made two shots, but he was active. Russell Westbrook hit a mid-range. But 
the other guys, it was really interesting. You know, we won the first quarter by 11, 38, 27, but we lost the second quarter 34 to 22. And then we broke even with them in the second half in both quarters. And it ended 49, 49 second half. So the fact that they beat us by one point in the second was ultimately the difference. And that was when the Clippers, you know, we just started going with more of a bench unit. You had guys like P.J. Tucker, who actually had some great rebounding in this game, some solid offensive rebounding. He even had this one where he was on the floor and had a nice pass. Where he, was, his, he was falling out of bounds. His back was about to hit out of bounds. He passed it to Paul George back towards half court. That was a nice play by him. But I was just encouraged with what I saw from James, from Zoo, from P.G. Of course, we're playing against a Utah team that's literally tanking like no other. But it was good to see it. Now, speaking of other things that were good to see, Daniel Tice. Again, I want to keep hearing your thoughts in the comments. Tice or Plumley? Funny enough, we finally got what some fans have been asking for in this game, which was two bigs at once, Plumley and Tice. And I don't even remember how long it was going on, but I just think that whatever happened in this game with Plumley and Tice playing with each other, We've never done it against real competition with our best players, so I just don't assume that he's going to do that in the playoffs unless it's drastic and we need it. But I always think that he'll go with P.J. Tucker at the four over Tice or Mason playing alongside each other kind of thing. So, yeah, let me know what you think of that. Tice was good, though. He was active, finishing around the rim, making some really solid reads in the short roll. And I don't know, Mason's a good passer, probably a better overall passer than Zoo or Tice. But I don't know why I'm more confident with Tice in the short roll. I just think Tice gives better effort works quicker with everything that he does and even though mason is the most vertical threat of any of our bigs and that's not saying much because they're both they're not necessarily i mean mason in his prime he was a high flyer but none of them are necessarily daniel gafford or Derek lively for example so in that sense i would still say mason is the best lob threat but tice just seems to get more dunks i don't know he's just more aggressive so i like tice he had a good game in this one. 14 points, 7 boards, 2 blocks on 6 for 9 shooting in 27 minutes. He did attempt 2 threes, which is relevant for me to say because we do talk about his ability to stretch the floor a little bit more than Zoo and obviously Plumlee, which they don't really stretch the floor at all. He was 0 for 2 from 3 in this game. Bones Highland, you know, he started out really rough. Don't think he played much defense at all in this game. Don't think the Clippers played much defense at all in this game, but Bones still had a stretch in the second half where he was putting on a show into the basket had a beautiful reverse right hand layup on the left side and the guy bones highland he is an absolute crowd pleaser he makes everybody jumping he gets the place jumping i should say and makes everybody go crazy 20 points for him five boards six assists three steals and a block wow only one turnover too on seven for 17 shooting three for 11 from three so that's where the inefficiency really came in was from three a lot of tough contested threes but we also were generating a lot of good threes too for a large portion of the game we just weren't making them 26 percent from three in this game for us but utah shot even worse 17 percent from three unbelievable kenneth lofton jr by the way was going crazy i don't know if this was the best game of his career or not but 27 points nine rebounds and eight assists for the guy on 10 for 16 shooting he was 10 for 11 from two he was insane. We <laughs> just couldn't stop him. But ultimately, in the end, Brandon Boston was starting to make some plays. Daniel Tice, Bones Highland got the game close. Brandon Boston, you know, he didn't shoot well in this game, but 10 points, five boards. I love his activity, and just it's good to see him just play consistently more. And I would be a bad host if I didn't talk about Kobe Brown. He's really shown some solid stuff the last couple of games. You can maybe even argue that the leash with him throughout the season was too short. You know, he had a bad stretch. Or not a bad stretch, but he was getting used to NBA basketball. And remember, this is a team that's competing for a championship this season. So not a lot of rookies are often in championship contending rotations. But we didn't really even give Kobe Brown a chance, even though that's the position that we need more of. And... Look, he doesn't look like that bad of a three-point shooter. I think that's what needs the most work. But attacking closeouts, he's not bad. He's strong and has shown some defensive chops. And he's a very underrated passer, I've noticed. He makes good decisions on the drive. He had a really nice steal and reverse dunk in this game. Seven points for him, four rebounds, two assists, three steals on three for eight shooting and one for three from three. Xavier Moon. He had a chance to take the lead at the end of the game. He missed. By the way, that was a foul at the end on the rebound. They just didn't call it because they wanted to get out of there like this was AYSO. That was a foul. 
But Xavier Moon, 1 for 4 from the field, 0 for 2 from 3. The one shot he made was a buzzer beater at the end of the third. He always gives good energy, and I just love how hard he works for his size. Gets up high in the air, got that in his jeans. Remember, Jamario Moon, former Clipper, former Harlem Globetrotter, former dunk contest participant in 2008 in New Orleans. He was a high flyer. Xavier, two points, four assists, three boards on one for four shooting. Brandon Boston, 10 points, five boards on four for 12 shooting. So didn't have a very good shooting game. 0 for two from three, two for two from the line. Then the Brewmaster, which was our the rotation player that got the most minutes. He had 31 minutes, had 16 points, six rebounds, and an assist on six for 15 shooting and three for nine from three. We lost by one. There's not much to say. We're now 51 and 30 on the year. 25 and 15 at home with one game left against the Rockets. As I said, as of now, we can tie the 2017 Clippers as the sixth best record in Clipper history. But if we win one more game, we'll be 52 and 30 and have sole possession of the fifth. Or we're tied for the fifth best record in Clipper history. If we have, if we win, we will be fifth after the 2015-16 Clips by a game, and the 20. 15, 2014, 15, and 2012, 13 clips were 56 and 26. And then, of course, our best ever regular season record, 2013, 14, 57 and 25. But yeah, moral of the story is that this, this game is nothing to talk about. It was good to see our young guys play, and that's about it. That's the takeaway. So, coming up, going to be talking about far more serious things like the Dallas Mavericks. I got to tell you a little something about FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks, 50 bucks, win or lose. And I'm telling you, it's time to bet on the Clippers to win that series against Dallas. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks to the Clippers beating Dallas, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win FanDuel America's number one sports book all right it's time to talk a little bit about Dallas and I want to say hello again to the Dallas fans that are tuning into both my channels so much these last couple of days I've been looking at my views and I'm just like I wake up one morning I'm like what the heck thousands more and it's all Dallas fans talking mess in the comments. But there are some that are saying, like, I like your analysis. I respectfully think this. And I love those kind of conversations. And you know what? The trash talkers, that comes with the territory. That's something I'm getting used to as a second-year host, as a YouTube, you know, content creator for four years now. Getting used to as the program, as the platform gets bigger. Going to be hearing more of these trolls. But let's talk basketball, right? I was supposed to release an episode, I told you, All Things Dallas, on Friday, but I didn't. And I want to apologize because I was torn. I didn't know whether to make an episode or not talk about the most pressing thing, and that's Kawhi's status. And if I'm going to do an episode on Dallas, deep dive, I'm going to do a deep dive on Dallas. The good news tonight and the takeaway I want you to take from this episode is that we have sealed home court advantage. I did not mention that yet at this at this in this show, which I should have probably, but the Kawhi thing is just so much more important because we kind of knew we were getting home court, but it was announced by public address announcer Eric Smith before the game that we had clinched the four seed. So an exact seeding rematch of the 2021 first round series between us and Dallas with the four five. But the biggest difference besides the actual rosters, of course, the Clippers weren't allowed to have nearly as many fans as Dallas. Dallas had near sold out crowds and we had cardboard cutouts in game seven. And I was at every game. If you want to check out what it looked like, go to my YouTube channel, go to playlist and go to the 2021 playoffs. And you can see all of it. We were, I was literally sitting next to cardboard cutouts, literally sitting next to cardboard cutouts. This is going to be different. Seeing Luca play in front of a sold out Clipper crowd. And I'm not saying like he's going to be rattled or anything, which a lot of Mavs fans are going to hear me say that and just run with it. I'm, it might fuel him even more. Probably will, but it's, it's just different. You know, as a, as a fan, it's just different. We've never had the hostility with Luca. It's just been, man, Luca's so good. And a couple of us are going ooh and ah, but there's a bunch of empty s- seats in the stadium. This is going to be sick. But what's most important is having a sold out Clipper playoff crowd watching our franchise player, not theirs. God damn. Please. 
I'm still knocking. I'm banging hard on it. I'm banging. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, I was going to make an episode, right? But I legitimately didn't feel like the episode would do justice. I want to do a preview for the Clipper fans, for all the Dallas fans that are going to come watch or listen. I need to make it thorough. And every segment is going to be covering that series. And this episode wasn't going to be that. So I decided against it. And instead, all I did was I watched the game that Dallas played against Miami, which they won decisively. And I took a bunch of notes. You're going to see, I have so much on this series. We're going to be talking basketball. We're going to talk, talk schemes. We're going to talk numbers. We're going to talk with Locked On Mavs host Nick. It's going to be amazing. This whole next week, and this is the advantage that we have, both Mavs and Clipper fans have, of not being in the plan. We have a whole week off. The basketball teams have a whole week off. The play-in, they're just going to be comfortably watching it when they go home at night, watching these teams battle for their lives while we're waiting for the next weekend. And that's a big advantage. Because the games that are going to happen on Friday, those teams in the play-in are playing on Sunday. You get one day to prepare and one day to rest for your number one or number two seed opposition. That's brutal. That's brutal. So the fact that we're resting is great. And also that we have home court because we had home court last time and it took a game seven to beat them. Every team won on the road until game seven, which was the first time that had ever happened. And we won. We have a good record about game sevens at home. We, the only one we lost was against Utah. Yeah. And I was at that. That was depressing. We didn't have Blake. That was so depressing, but golden state, we beat them. That was the, was that really the first game seven we ever hosted? That's amazing. That was the first Game 7 we ever hosted in franchise history. Am I tripping? I, we Yeah. Because we beat the Nuggets in 5 and then we lost in 7 in Phoenix in 2006. And we never hosted a Game 7 because we never... The first round wasn't even Game 7 before. So, that's crazy. I never even thought about that. I was at the first Game 7 ever that night against Golden State. Amazing. And we beat them. And we beat San Antonio the next year. Then we lost to Utah. And then the next one we had was that Dallas one. So... Yeah, we're three and one. I'll take my chances. Game seven, Clippers and seven. That's my pick for the series, Clippers and seven. People are saying Clippers and six. I just don't see it. I just don't see how we beat Luka with a better team, even though we're better. I acknowledge that. But it took us six. We were down two nothing and then three two. I don't think that's going to happen again. I think it's going to be either two nothing Clippers or one one split after the first two games. But like, it took everything to beat them. And there's a lot of context missing. From Mavs fans saying, it took you that much to beat us with, with nobody helping Luka. So now that we have help, we're going to kill you. Like, and guaranteed win. That's missing a lot of context because you're only looking at it from your side. You're not looking at it from all the stupid things we did the first two games that are probably not happening this time. For the simple fact that we have actually had this coaching staff, guys like Zoo, Kawhi, Terrence, and Paul, for three straight years. Four straight years. So it's a little different. We Ty Lue's learned a couple things about these guys. So... But I just, my, my, my moral of the story is seven games because I think the Mavs are better than they were then. Luka's better than he was then. And it took us that much. So I think it's going to be seven again. And I think we're going to win again. But we're going to talk way more about it in the coming episodes. Next week is a Clippers Mavs marathon. It's going to be a marathon on this channel. It's going to be amazing. And Dime Dropper, every single series will be covered there. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod and subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, where two more vlogs of the regular season will be out. I'm going to post my video from Friday night, and it's going to be some of the game. It was some cool stuff. By the way, the crowd was really good on Friday night, even though it was, it may have been sold out. Let me check the attendance numbers, actually. Yeah, it was listed as a sellout, but a bunch of people didn't go. The 300 section, there's a lot of empty seats, so it didn't feel like a sellout, but the crowd was really good. Most Friday night Clipper crowds are good, and... Check it out, and I also asked a bunch of Mavs, um, Mavs fans. I also asked a bunch of Clipper fans what their thoughts are on the Mavs series, so you can check that out. It'll be out on Saturday afternoon. By the time you're listening to this, it'll be out. And then last ever Clipper regular season game at Staples Center on Sunday, I will be there, and you'll get a video of that as well. That'll be a very sentimental moment for me because I never went to games at the sports arena. Like This is where I fell in love with the Clippers, so it'll mean a lot for me. We're going through it all. It's going to be an emotional next couple of weeks, ladies and gentlemen, and I can't wait for you to be here with me to hold on to what's going to be either great memories or terrible memories. But one thing is for sure, 
win or lose, we'll be here together. We keep on supporting the boys. We keep on supporting the Clips. That's what it's all about. Most loyal fans in the NBA. Is this the year that we finally get rewarded for our actual worst pain of any fan base ever? That's a fact, by the way. I don't even want to hear your arguments in the comments about the Minnesota Timberwolves fans have had to endure more. You've been around for like 40, like not even 40 years. So, and I know I'm 25 saying that, but hey, man, the history carries on. I have to hear about 17 championships all the time in my own city. Half of these fans weren't even in the, you know, weren't even sperm cells when Magic was running that fast break. So, you know, the history follows. We have to hear about zero rings all the time. So, no, nothing more abusive in an NBA fan than being a Clipper fan. But I'll never, I would not have it any other way. Because, damn it, I'm going to be at every playoff game. And not a lot of fans can, for an affordable price. And not a lot of fans can say that. And if you think it's because there's no supply and demand, like, people are still going to pack that place out. So, we're just not the Lakers ripping fans off for tickets. <laughs> All right, I'm done. The age-old proverb continues. Go Clippers. Get well soon, Kawhi. I need you, brother.